is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Veronica Mars, Season 2, Episode 14, Versatile Toppings. In this episode, there's somebody out there who is blackmailing gay teens at Veronica's high school. And she tracks down who done it, and I'm not super satisfied with how this got dealt with, but I guess I'll let it slide. Also, things wind up in a situation that makes it look like Jackie's dad is definitely guilty. And I'm a little surprised that Veronica is falling for this. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Rachel for commissioning this episode. Oh, Rachel's here in the chat. Hello, Rachel. And Agnes is here. Hello to both of you. Um, so, yeah, this episode was really surprising because I had had an enormous issue with what went on in the previous episode regarding a trans person or a crossdresser or, you know, who knows, um, being like the butt of a joke at Dick's expense. Um, and I kind of just wanted to let that lie and let it be its thing that I was disappointed in that we never talked of again. But then this episode starts and it turns out that we are going to be bringing that up again. And I was just a little bit like, ah, oh, no, really? Can we not? Um, I am not entirely sure what the title Versatile Toppings is in reference to. There have been a couple times where titles have sort of gotten away from me and I wasn't really sure where they were coming from. Um, but I'm not really like, I I've been thinking about this one since I watched it and I can't. So if you guys have an idea, let me know on that. Um, I am... This episode, there's a couple of different things going on. First of all, I would like to register my appreciation that despite the fact that I don't like Jackie, the show is really taking it pretty slow when it comes to m like making Jackie and Veronica be friendly with each other. I'm not even going to say be friends, friendly, um, because I obviously am in this place where I just still don't like her, don't trust her don't really know why the show wants me to and what, you know, they're thinking when they assume that that's going to happen. Um, and I would like for them to eventually be buds, but we don't need that right now. Right? Like we just can do this slowly. The thing is, it's like, the way this episode ends, it feels like that's sort of going to wind up blowing up in both their faces. So I'd be interested in seeing what, like, by the end of this season, was this meant to be a sort of a setup that gets it so that they're almost friends and then they wind up not being, but it's like a close thing? Is this something that gets in the way a little bit, but they're able to overcome it? Is it something that prevents it from ever happening? Is it something that, like... Jackie, like, convinces her, there's no way my dad is guilty, help me prove it, you know, the whole thing. I don't know. But I'll be very curious to see how this works out. Um, Rachel says, I think it's like top bottom. And when you're versatile, you're open to both. But like a pun version. That didn't even occur to me, Rachel. That it would be something that's like that kind of a sexual pun. Because that feels like off brand for the show. But I guess there were a lot of like dick jokes in the last episode. So maybe, maybe that is what it is. That didn't even like occur to me. But maybe that's what it is. She says maybe that's reading into it. I mean, it could be reading into it, but I honestly can't think of a single other reasonable like meaning. So that for right now, that's like the closest I'm going to get to something that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, this uh, this episode is 
a really, it's like kind of um, a melancholy one for me because of how many gay students there are that are not feeling like they can be out who are just so concerned still with people finding out. And, you know, it's one of those things that I really want to believe it's better now that people are freer to be who they are. And I'm sure to a degree that's true, but it's the sort of thing that like, I also think we tend to comfort ourselves in a, like a sort of a cloak of false, uh, a false perception of progress that might not actually be there because it's uncomfortable for us to think about how dangerous this still is for people. And there is a part where she's talking to this one kid who winds up like selling off a bunch of his rims and stuff in order to pay the blackmailer. And when she asks him why he's so worried, he's like, I literally want to stay alive. I want to make it through high school. And that is something that I wish more people understood when it comes to fighting for certain people's rights, the lamentations on identity politics and people being like, it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter, then you should be supportive of people because then what does it matter? Who does that hurt? Nobody. It helps. But you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a serious issue. Um, and I know at my school, there were a couple of people who were out, but it wasn't like it came without its price. I definitely saw them. I never saw them being bullied to their faces. I always saw the kind of like snide remarks said to in groups as they would walk by kind of thing. Often it wasn't done so that it was loud enough for that person to hear. It was like, I think that the person probably did hear, but it didn't feel like that was the way it was meant to work. But inevitably that person knew that they were being talked about. And it was just really sort of a hard thing to watch. And I always admired because there was one particular guy who um, I knew a little bit better than the others because he was in drama with me. And he was somebody that I think was the first to come out and made it feel a little bit safer for some other people after him. And I have always thought how brave it was because I think that he was like the first that I had heard about in my school period and being the person to sort of forge ahead on that is no small feat. I mean, as a teen with the amount of pressure that you're under to conform, that is fucking seriously impressive and really just like the, it, it's a kind of bravery that, I feel a lot of us probably couldn't have even now as adults. Um, so anyway, I am guys, I'm over here giving you like my impressions because I have been trying to play this episode on Hulu on my computer. Again, it's not working. I don't know why this is happening. I watched it on Hulu just yesterday and this isn't working. I'm going to try a new incognito window and sign in and see if that works. Um, and I'm trying, I'm, there was another thing, another theme on this, ep in this episode that I really, oh my God. Okay. So I know what I wanted to talk about was what's going on with Logan and this girl. What is her name again? Um, this girl, God, guys, she is so thin. Like, I'm not trying to body shame at all. People will just have different body types, but it's just oh, the kind of thing that if somebody looks thin, like really thin, on television, you know, they've got to be super duper thin in person because n people look normal on TV that are excruciatingly skinny in person. Oh, good. It's working in the incognito window. Yay. Okay, good. Um, but yeah, this whole thing with Logan, like he tells her, Hannah, thank you guys. Um, Hugabug says on the Veronica Mars wiki, it says the episode title is a pun on both pizza toppings and gay sexual reference to a man who likes both topping and bottoming. No shit. Okay. Well, 
All right, Veronica Mars. And the pizza toppings, that didn't even enter my mind because of the muggings. Of course, that makes such sense. I didn't even think of this. Um, but Logan says to Hannah a little bit later that he had no idea who her dad was. Do we believe this? I want to believe this because I would like for Logan to not constantly be playing an angle. But I don't think that's true at all, right? He ab- he didn't show the slightest sign of surprise when he saw who was picking her up. And he wanted to be there when her father came to get her in a way that comes off as such gentlemanly, like, concern of, like, escorting her. And that is sort of just not who Logan really is. And I just don't think that that's likely and I'll be, I'm sort of paranoid because I kind of like Hannah. She's sort of not really anything personality wise so far. I do like the fact that she calls him out for the way that he ignores her. So that's something she stands up for herself and she notices when somebody's doing her wrong and she's not afraid to say that and she's not afraid to acknowledge that's exactly what's happening without wondering if she's reading into something too much. So I like that. Um, But I just kind of am not looking forward to the moment where she like figures out that he definitely knew and realizes that she has been being used. Rachel says, no way. I feel like it would be a hugest coincidence. Yeah. It just feels a little bit too, it's too perfect, you know, and the, and the way that her dad comes at him and is like, what do I need to do to get you to leave her alone? It's this is like a conversation that Logan, it feels like has been preparing to have. It definitely feels like he put himself here because this was to his advantage. And I feel really bad for Hannah because she's just in the middle of a game that she doesn't understand and when it has to do with your parents, that's extra difficult, difficult because like her parents just split up, we find out, um, which turns out to be due to the root cause of her father's addiction, which is what's motivating him to pin the blame on Logan. The whole thing is really, really like, it, it's such a tangled mess. And him only giving her a part of the story is I mean, I'm sure to a degree at this point, Logan really believes that that's all she needs to know. I honestly do think that's true. I'm not trying to give him too much credit, but I'm sure that he really doesn't think knowing about everything is going to help at all. That All she needs to understand is her father's motivations for trying to keep them apart. But I just feel like it's inevitable that some other stuff is going to start to come out and she is going to find out not only that I mean, there's so, there's so much to this, but just what it comes down to in the end is that Logan like was a predator in a way, zeroing in on prey when he met her, that it wasn't a cute chance meeting that it wasn't, I found you so irresistible. It was just straight up. I had a goal. And you were a piece of the puzzle that I needed to make it happen. And I'm, I I certainly think at this point that he does really like her. I don't get the impression that he's like, all right, I did what I needed to do. And you believe me and your dad's a shit. So I figure we're done. He's clearly trying to hang on. But I just, Logan, dude, I want you so much to like be in an okay place in life. And I'm so torn because I know that's not going to happen for you if you keep doing things like this and treating people like this. But at the same time, you have a murder charge against you and wanting to do what you can to prove someone is lying. I'm not mad at you for that either. So I just have a lot of mixed feelings about handling it this way. And I don't know what I would have done differently. You know, I might have like gotten like, could he have approached her before she knew him and try to explain what he thought? I'm, I'm doubt it. He's just some nobody that's like, why would she listen to him? You know, 
And even if she does know now that he was telling the truth and that he didn't do it and that her father has a coke problem, she goes through his phone and she sees all of these speed dials for the Fitzpatricks and for River Styx, all of this stuff that clearly links him to the Fitzpatricks and she finds the coke in like hidden in the uh, medicine cabinet. Despite knowing all of this is true about her father, what does that do for Logan? Because in the end, he wants this dude to drop the charges. Is she going to go to her father and tell him you better drop the charges because I know all about this? I don't see that. I mean, maybe it would be cool if she did. I would admire the hell out of that. But I just don't really think that's going to. I mean, again, this is her father who she lives with. It's a tough thing when you've like got parents that just split up and she only has the one that she's like dependent on right now to throw him to the wolves is essentially trying to throw herself into the same situation as Logan of having no parent home, except she doesn't have like a pile of money to fall back on. I'm sure that her mother would like get back in the picture if this were to go down. Like, you know, it doesn't sound like her mother abandoned her or anything. Um, But she'd really have to be like ready for her father to go to jail potentially for a false report, you know, and not just jail. If the Fitzpatrick's find out that he recants his testimony, I'm a hundred percent that they would kill him. So I just feel like Logan's trying to position himself so that she will help him out. I don't really know that there's enough in it for her to want to help him out at the expense of her dad's life, potentially, you know, uh, Rachel says, I think his original goal was drop the charges and I'll stay away from Hannah. So telling Hannah is trying to get her on Logan's side so she won't break up with Logan herself. That's interesting, Rachel. I didn't really even just think about it in those terms, was, which is that his relationship with Hannah is his leverage and he can't lose that. So he's trying to hang on to her so that he still has leverage over her father. And it's not that he wants Hannah to convince her dad. He just needs her dad to feel pressure. And his relationship with Hannah is the thing that he can use. Yeah, I guess that makes more sense. That would, And that leaves a lot more potential for her to find out that this is why they're together. Because he had the fucking confrontation with her father just like two rooms away. Telling her dad straight up. I'll leave her alone if you drop the charges. So all she has to do is walk in on that conversation and she will find out that this is what he's angling for and has been angling for. And that could lose him his leverage and wind up like shooting the whole plan and the whole reason for doing this in the foot. Um, And I wonder like what kind of sympathy she would have because at this point, I mean, imagine this, that you were dating a guy that you thought really liked you. And then you found out that it was something like this, that he was dating you because his own life was in danger and he could potentially go to prison and he was using you to ensure that that didn't happen. On the one hand, you're disgusted that he would use you this way. But on the other hand, he was going to go to jail for a crime he didn't commit, which is huge. And I feel like with the personality that I have, I think I'd have a really hard time not having some sympathy for him in that situation. You know, like I would be pissed. I wouldn't want to keep dating him, but I don't feel like it would be as easy for me to throw him away as it would be if, say, he were using me as leverage to like be a partner in my dad's firm or something that was totally specifically just selfish. I don't think that it's selfish to not want to be falsely accused of murder. So I wonder, I, there's all kinds of ways this could go. There are all different kinds of ways that she could react, ways that she could find out and reactions that her father could have. I really want what I think would be the smartest thing to do is for Logan to try this conversation again while wearing a wire. And that way he has this dude on tape being like, no, I'm going to keep pressing the charges against you, even though I know you didn't do it. 
And he can go to the police with that and be like, look, he'd have to prove that it was that guy talking. But I feel like that would be an easier do than getting the guy to recant his testimony voluntarily. Um, but now that they've had the conversation once, I don't know how he can have it again and have that be like subtle or, you know, not look suspicious to this guy himself and to his daughter who is maybe starting to wonder why her boyfriend always wants to be alone with her dad and talk to him. Um, Rachel says, I think it depends on how you find out. If you hear it from his own mouth, it might be different than if say her dad tells her, because how can she believe her dad anymore? That's true. Um, I'm just sort of thinking of this as her walking in and accidentally finding out. But if Logan were to straight up confess to her, that could go a couple ways, you know? It really just depends on how betrayed you feel, how close you have felt, how much you have trusted the person. And honestly, too, he tells her, you know, at this point, I had no idea who your dad was. So it's pretty clear he thinks that she's going to be suspicious. This is all he wanted from the beginning. And I think that has to be on her mind already. There's no way it didn't occur to her what a huge coincidence this is and that there's the potential that Logan was just doing this on purpose. Because if all it is is her dad is like, oh, yeah, Logan's an accused murderer, which honestly, there's no way they go to the same school and she didn't already know that about Logan. That was the one part of this that I found really bizarre was that you know, she talks to him later and she's like, dad told me that, you know, he saw everything and that he saw you on the bridge. And I guess that her father's identity hasn't been revealed that he's the one who made the call. It's sort of like, I don't know how this works. And, and guys, if you do, please let me know, like the, the details of this. If you call in a tip to the police and you do it anonymously, but then you come forward and tell them, yo, it was me that made this call. Is that part of public record by then? It didn't feel like when he went and talked to Sheriff Lamb, like he went on record. But it didn't. I don't remember him saying not to tell anybody it was him either. And even if he did, I don't know that Sheriff Lamb could. Like, obviously, Sheriff Lamb will do what he wants because he's just corrupt and will do whatever. But according to the law, can police keep a witness like this anonymous is that something that is an option when it's this sort of case and not something that's like you know organized crime where your life would be in danger for having seen something um yeah i'm i'm really curious how that would work because i just don't see her not knowing that logan had been accused of this apparently it was quite a media circus when he was like first implicated and he was already very high profile for what had happened with his father. So this would have been huge news. I mean, can you imagine like right after her father, his father tries to burn Veronica Mars alive inside a refrigerator that same night he supposedly stabbed a guy. That's just, there's no way she doesn't know about that. So the only thing that we could assume maybe she didn't know was that her father was the witness. Um, and again, I just don't know that it makes sense that that wouldn't be public and that she wouldn't already know that. But regardless of that, what I the the whole reason that I went down this road was my like starting to realize that Logan's assuming she's suspicious right out of the gate. So he's kind of at a disadvantage here. And while it turns out that he is right in what he tells her about her father's reasoning for doing what he did and for his own, like, you know, vulnerability to the Fitzpatrick's. Despite being right about that, that doesn't necessarily set her mind at ease that he's telling the truth that he didn't know who her dad was to begin with. I'm just very curious about all of this. Like, and I, uh, I don't really know what it is about Hannah that I like. I know I've seen her in something before. She looks so familiar. Um, but I do like her, you know, which is super helpful. I feel like that's a very difficult to quantify sort of quality in a person, what makes them likable on screen right away. And if I didn't like her, I would be a lot less interested 
and invested in this. And I don't mean invested in their relationship. It's not like I give a shit whether her and Logan stay together. I'm interested in like Hannah not getting super hurt by this because she's just an innocent like man in the middle between two dudes with their own total agendas who are both lying to her for their own reasons. And I just find that I have a lot of sympathy for that, you know? Um, anyway, okay. So I basically went through that whole plot line, but I'm just, you know, I, I would love any sort of feedback that you guys have on how that would work and why she might not know that Logan was the one that was accused and whatnot. Um, so this episode, it starts off with, uh, the, banging up of Veronica's car by Dick in the parking lot. And she sort of haunts him for the rest of the episode, trying to get him to fix her car because he gets some of the paint from his on hers, which he like has the fucking gall to be like, well, my paint's probably just worth more than your paint. So I bet you that your car is worth more now that I dinged it than it was before, which I'm like, that's cold blooded dude. Um, but yeah, he's in the middle of like joking around with her about how he's just going to totally not take responsibility for this when two varsity guys come up and start to razz him about what happened at the carnival and like being like, relax, dude, we don't think you're gay just because you make out with a dude every now and then. And I'm just like, uh, can we not do this? But it turns out that the guy was uh, actually gay himself, the one saying this, and that he participated in, you know, it, it's a... It's one of those things, it's a good way to throw people off the scent if you are worried about someone finding out. It also plays into a weird stereotype that I feel like we don't talk about very much. And it gives me an uncomfortable feeling and I'm, it's hard for me to really give voice as to why. But there is something about any time someone expresses deep homophobia, like... The kind of homophobia that comes out in like really d like demeaning or religiously charged language, there is inevitably somebody who makes a response akin to you must be this disgusted by it because you personally have homo homosexual feelings and you're super scared of that. And so you're having this like intense reaction because you are terrified of whatever it is that you are hiding. Essentially, people would only be that vocally anti-gay if they were afraid of the fact that they themselves might be gay. And while I definitely get where people are coming from on that, and I think that maybe that is true some of the time, I also feel like there is something about that that leads to continuing with making fun does that make sense like so basically i like oh well uh maybe you're so worried about all their dicks because you wish you had one of their dicks in your mouth which it just like turns around and becomes another homophobic joke in itself which i have seen happen and it's super weird because it's like they try and make it like oh i only made that joke in defense of gay people why are you getting upset but there's a tone to it that still makes then homosexuality seem like demeaning or like something that they should be ashamed of. And I, I'm just sort of, you know, like, I don't know if you guys get what I'm saying here. Um, and it's again, something that I haven't really been able to like put a finger on precisely what about this sort of accusation makes me uncomfortable um, and I don't feel like the show is really doing that too badly here. Like it, what he says later about just trying to defend himself preemptively, it unfortunately does make a lot of sense. But there is that sort of like assumption made in circles that I feel really cringy and weird about. Um, oh, Rachel says the actress who played Hannah was on Once Upon a Time. If you watched that, she played Cinderella. 
Maybe that is where I know her from. I don't really remember if I met Cinderella. What season was that in? I only watched the first two seasons. And then once we started to get into Peter Pan stuff, I just really started to lose interest. Um, and says, what you're saying makes sense. Oh, that's good. I'm glad somebody gets it. I don't remember her in Once Upon a Time, but haven't seen all the seasons. Was in four episodes. She was also in Mad Men and Falling Skies. Never seen either of those. Reminds me of Brittany Snow, who is in Pitch Perfect and Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Um, it was in and out over about five seasons. Yeah, no, I don't remember. Her. Like, that might be what it is. Because she has the kind of face that it's not... Some people, as soon as I... Like, if I remember them vaguely from a recurring role, when they reappear, I remember that guy was a creep. Or this guy was like kind of nuts. Or this woman was really religious. I remember her being like really. And I don't get any of that with her. Her face just looks familiar, but I'm not associating it with specific like traits. So it's probably something that was kind of in passing. So once upon a time is likely what it was. Um, but anyway, so the whole thing, I, I'm also curious about this, guys. Logan's plan with her, it seems like it sort of hinges on him not being real public about the fact that they're together. And he tries to tell her that it's because he is protecting her after bad shit has happened to both of his exes. And I like, I can't really think why hiding the two of them being together really helps his plan. So I'm sort of wondering if he isn't being honest about that a little bit. But yeah, I don't know. Um, Because this like the the first scene in this after, you know, Dick being made fun of is the two of them making out like near the snack machine in secret and him telling her that like they should keep this to themselves. And uh, I'm not really sure what that's about. But anyway, so then we have a scene where Madison, who is the head cheerleader, I guess, um, she is reading a poem that she found or that was stuck in her locker. I guess it was on like taped to her locker um, that is allegedly was allegedly written by this girl. And it's all about pretending to be somebody else and like watching Madison in the shower and generally like a humiliating, I have a crush. I'm gay. I don't know what to do poem that was meant to be private. And Madison reading it is literally like your worst nightmare. Like the fact that this girl doesn't just burst into tears right there is frankly impressive because if I had been her, I would have lost it. Like that's just so embarrassing that it's not just being outed when you don't want to be out. It's like all of the insecurities that go along with that being read verbatim as you wrote them by a person who is potentially the worst option. If you were going to choose somebody to find out about this, Madison would literally be at the top of the threat list. And she's the one who gets a hold of it. Like, Oh my God, get out of here. That's the worst. Um, And Veronica gets taken aside by this kid who had been in a previous episode um, because it turned out that he was like tormenting the parents of one of the kids who got killed in the bus crash because that kid had been his boyfriend and his parents basically like put their son in a position where he had to be on that bus in order to stay away from their relationship. And he blames he blames his ex's parents for his ex's death. Um, And he is here telling Veronica that like, he is a pizza guy and that there have been a couple of attacks that there was some shit that was getting, um, they get tased in the back of the neck and then they get mugged. And he said that there was some shit in his wallet that he doesn't know if they were specifically after, but it feels like it was. And he says the whole Marlena thing was my fault. Marlena's name 
was on a list with nine other gay students. That poem everyone was making fun of, Marlena posted it onto a website that I set up. Um, and it turns out that this is a chat room. It's called the Pirate Ship Student Homosexual Internet Posting, which is a tortured acronym, but okay, sure. Um, but yeah, they are... It's a site that Mac helped him set up, which I was really delighted by. And uh, he says that he was in charge of maintaining usernames and passwords. And somebody got the list. Which, honestly, dude, what are you doing walking around with those written down? You can maintain those and not have them literally on a piece of paper. What is this, 1995? What are you doing? It's like he's the school administrator whose password is password and they still need it written on a post-it stuck to their monitor. Um, and, you know, this this whole thing is somebody just trying to extort these students for money to keep them from getting outed. And he says, we're each of us good for a hundred bucks. I can't give you the names of the other people, but we want you to find this blackmailer. And Veronica is like, honestly, I get her just needing to make a living and get by and that's fine. But I just really wanted her to do this for free for the sake of the fact that these kids would like probably be in genuine danger. If it comes out like, not even just at school, not even the their fellow students making fun of them, but who knows how their parents are going to react. You know, like I saw some fucking um, statistic the other day and it was something like gay and lesbian teens make up only like 15% of the overall teen population, but they make up something like 55% or 60% of homeless teens because they frequently are kicked out when they when their parents find out. And that's just such a legit danger that I just don't feel like people take seriously. Everybody wants to be like, just be who you are. It's not that simple when you are somebody who depends on other people to live. I have a really close friend who came out to me as trans, but they are currently living with huge assistance from their parents and their parents are homophobic as fuck and they don't know if they're ever going to be able to come out and be honest about who they are in the next like five years because they don't have the money to live on their own work and their parents will cut them off if they find out. So, um, so anyway, yeah, this come then comes the, um, scene where Logan walks right by Hannah and acts like he doesn't know her and it's super like awkward and weird and she looks like she doesn't know what the hell is going on and then we have the other cheerleader and what is this girl's name she's the one that straight up tells Veronica that she's a lesbian um, and is being and tells her I'm being blackmailed and we find out later that she is the one doing the blackmailing which makes a lot of sense because in this scene there was no distress coming off her at all. She keeps saying things like, I have not got that kind of money. I'm dead with this really like, and I couldn't tell at the time if she is just a really bad actress, which I think also is part of it. But in general, it just felt wrong the whole way she was behaving. And I was suspicious of her from the start, but I didn't want it to be another gay teen doing the blackmailing because that just felt a little bit sort of like weirdly victim blamey to me. Um, and I'm not even saying that that is it, but it just does kind of strike a, a sour note for me in a way. Um, Anya says, I have the same way to think about characters. Like she was a mom. He played a teenager or son. Yeah, see, exactly. Um, so, she says, respond to the email, ask for another 24 hours. I'll handle the cash and drop off. And she says, thanks, Veronica. Um, Rachel says, is that the girl played by Kristen Cavallar from the Hills? If so, it was a stunt casting. Ooh, that girl's on another show. She shouldn't be. She's not good at this. Like, no offense, Kristen Cavallar, if you're watching this, which I'm sure you are. 
you're not a good actor and you shouldn't be on TV. Um, a reality show from a long time ago. Okay. Reality show makes a whole lot more sense because she's cute. I could see her being appealing, but just mm -mm, no. Um, so we have Veronica and she's, um, answering the phone and finds out that her father is working for Terrence Cook, which at this time, Veronica still really feels like he's guilty and is sort of side eyeing her father for the fact that he is even working with this dude and accuses him of like, just kind of having still hero worship because this guy is a, you know, a sportsman that her father really likes. And while I definitely understand her frustration here, or at least her like distrust, she has made some calls herself for reasons that are, you know, not, really apparent to other people and I just want her to trust her dad a little bit more um and he says I thought you would be a little bit more excited and she's like yeah I mean I guess if it turns out that he like he when he says I thought you'd be excited she's like why would I be excited it would be good if he was guilty because then it would mean that people didn't die because of me and he's like, no, no, no. Excited that I'm helping your friend's dad. And this is when she's like, oh, that's precious. Friends? No, that's not how we are together. It's nice that you think that and you're adorable, but definitely not. Um, and it winds up like they accidentally get shoved into a car together because she is going to go to this game and she doesn't have a ride because of I don't even remember. She says something about Dick and like he just dinged her door. So I don't know why she doesn't. But in any case, Jackie winds up giving her a ride and they go to like Jackie's dad's literal hangar filled with uh, spare fun sports cars. It's like he's it's it's like the equivalent of having a walk in closet with like shoe display cubbies except for cars, which is honestly just not fair. Like this is guys, just, just for a second. When is, when do we decide somebody's officially just got too much money? Cause I feel like having multiple hundred thousand dollar sports cars, really that should be one of the lines we draw there's no need for this. Literally, what are you in the mood for right now for a car? No. What are you in the mood for is the drive through at Taco Bell. You don't get to have a what are you in the mood for with cars. I just, mm -mm, no. Nope, there's a point. It's like being what are you in the mood for with houses, you know? I think tonight I'll go, I'll use the Paris flat because I'm really feeling like I would like a nice brioche. Like, what are you high? No, that's not life. Don't do this. Anya says, couldn't he pay off his debt by selling his cars? Anya makes a good fucking point. It seems like there used to be way more of them. Anya. So it's because something Jackie says, I think that he has been, but I, you know, it does seem like he just, he, he's like, well, I used to have 20 and now I only have six. Mm, now, sorry for you guy. Get get down to one and then I'll be like, wow, you really did something. But no, you know, you like get a Hyundai, sell these other cars, be be sane about this. This is the kind of thing where it's like if you're super rich, being financially irresponsible is just seen as sort of a charming quality that's nihilistic versus like you are a drain on society, which you are. If you're rich and you're acting like this, you are so much more of a drain on society than poor people, but whatever. Okay, sure. Um, so I'm trying to see like, oh, right. So this whole thing, Keith is trying to figure out exactly how he can establish that Terrence was busy at the time of the phone call to the car bomb that was set up um, to go off, you know, when somebody made a call from a specific or not from a specific number to a specific number. 
And what he has to do is get security footage from the casino, of course, that Terrence was at. Um, and this dude who works at the casino, who owns the place, is also the casino owner in um, Parks and Rec. And I have to wonder, this is another one of those awful things where it's like, if you are a actor who falls within a specific ethnic group, then you only ever get very specific roles like this. And the fact that I have only ever see this, seen this actor in like three roles and two of them were casino owners is just such a fucking tragedy. Um, and he basically tells Keith, the guy who owns the place, Leonard Lobo, I am like millions of dollars in debt to that dude. So he's not going to want to do any favors to help me out. Like, not only that, but they guard their security footage very closely. So good luck getting it even in the best of times. And then he hears it's for my benefit. and They definitely are not going to give a shit. And that's pretty much exactly what happens. Lobos winds up giving him shots from like, they're not even, it's not even like a uh, video. It's still frames of him sitting at the table with a five minute gap exactly during the moments where he could have made the phone call so that basically he can say that he complied with Keith's request while giving him nothing actually useful, which is pretty low. Um, but yeah, he has his issue and is really just going to be petty about it. And to a degree, I respect that because you know what? We got a person of color who's indebted to another person of color. This is just not a great situation overall. But when you've got a uh, million dollars riding on and somebody has taken out that credit and still has not paid it back, I, I'm kind of okay with uh, you getting to be a little bit petty. Except that like this petty is, is going to lead to a guy being accused of murdering a bus of kids. So I guess not this kind of petty. I don't know, guys. I'm, I'm usually here for petty is what I'm saying. But there are there are limits. Um, so we have the moment where um, Kylie, who is uh, interviewing this other kid who claims that his rims got stolen, where we try and act like this is all part of the same like mugger. When it's a totally different MO, it just doesn't make sense. Of course, it's not the same thing. Um, but she interviews him real quick. And then she comes out on camera and says, I'm gay. Marlena Nichols is my girlfriend. And it's this whole like, you know, dramatic reveal. And everybody is really like surprised by it. It's uh, a weird thing. Whenever this happens, like somebody comes out as gay. Veronica has a, a sort of like her reaction is one of like mild amusement. It's always just weird. I noticed it throughout this episode that she f seems to be unsure what expression she should be wearing on her face whenever somebody comes out. Um, but then we see Kylie and Marlena walking down the hallway and Kylie has her shoulders back and her head up and is clearly very happy with the situation. And Marlena is smiling a little despite herself because of the fact that, first of all, she pulled a really hot girlfriend. And second of all, that hot girlfriend is clearly proud to be with her. So she's happy about that. But she certainly does not have the confidence that Kylie has. Um, and fucking Dick and one of his friends are like watching them walk by and totally like objectifying them in this super gross way that many lesbians are very familiar with, I'm sure. Unfortunate thing. Um, Veronica comes up to Dick and is trying to talk to him about her car repair. And there is a really interesting moment here. He says, you got to learn to leave me alone. And she says, I thought we were going to be pals. And he says, please, you date Logan? He's nailed for murder. You date Duncan? He's wanted for kidnapping. You get put on Robbie and Hunter's jury. They get sent to Chino. 
You're like rich dude kryptonite, Veronica. The rich, this rich dude wants no part of it. And when he walks away, as much as this is an asshole thing that Dick says and he's the worst, you can see on her face that she's a little fucked up over it. Because it does seem like anybody that gets anywhere near her winds up in a pretty terrible situation. Now, that is not to say that in any way at all, it's her fault. They made the decisions they made. It, but she is somebody who already is blaming herself for the deaths of a bunch of people. And for him to just be like, hey, all of these other people's suffering sort of seems to line up with you being in their life. That is something that she clearly kind of believes already. And he's just reinforcing it in his usual tactless, shitty way. And it's just like, it's a bummer, you know, the look that she gets on her face. It seems like she really was hurt by that in a way that I wouldn't imagine Dick would be able to ever hurt her. Um, So then she goes and talks to this other girl, the one that had been giving a popsicle a blowjob, which was apparently such a huge like scandal at the time. And she's kind of gotten over it apparently, but she asks, um, she says, any idea why the pizza mugger used your name? Because this pizza mugger is pretending to be from certain people's houses and ordering pizzas so that they can then jump the delivery guy when he arrives and the person who allegedly ordered the pizza did not. And when she says, like, look at this list and see if any of this, like, if there's a pattern, she says, you live somewhat close together, but is there anything else that ties you together? And she says, we're all coconuts. And Veronica says, mm, sorry, what now? And she says, that's what you get called in Neptune when you're Latino and date white people and join the honor society. And I love this look that Veronica gets on her face because she's explaining like, you know, like Oreos, except we're brown on the outside. And, and Veronica's like, no, 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 I get it. But this is the look that somebody who doesn't think about this sort of stuff gets on their face when they realize that there's like a, a whole new slur that they never heard of. Honestly, I continue to be shocked at the specificity of slurs and like how arbitrary a lot of the conditions for them seem to be. It's just, but I had never heard this. Had you guys heard of coconuts? I am Latino. Like I, I date white dudes. I have like a white mom and I was on National Hispanic Honor Society. <laughs> But I have never, ever heard this before. Um, maybe it's because I don't look as Latino. But whatever the case, she's, uh, you know, starting to wonder if maybe that's what it is. Like, she says, maybe you could help. Um, can you make me a list of everyone you can think of who gets made fun of for being a coconut? And when she says being a coconut, there's something sort of adorable about it. Um. So she approaches that kid who claimed that his rims got stolen. He's real weird about it. It's super clear that he is lying through his teeth about what the hell happened. Um, and Veronica is pretty pushy about it. But he, she winds up just sort of leaving it because it's clear something is up. And uh, meanwhile, Keith, he gets the like um, unhelpful stills from the casino. But then he finds out from one of the guys that the the cell phone signals in the casino are scrambled so that people can't use their phones to cheat. I don't know how you could even do that. Like, I'm sure there's ways they wouldn't do it if it was impossible, but it just would require the sort of uh, creativity that I just don't even think of. Um, but that is enough for Keith to feel pretty confident that it wasn't Terrence that he couldn't have done it because I think this is just as much about Keith proving to himself that he is not defending a guilty guy. Um, and in the end, even though it's all sort of like tentative, he does go and bring Terrence to Sheriff Lamb and is like, first of all, 
circumstantially, this guy is very likely not guilty. Here's all the reasons. But second of all, we do have this recording of you trying to blackmail him. So if you try and press charges, he's going to release this. To which Sheriff Lamb has a pretty honestly solidly thought out response. Essentially, you have so much more to lose than I do. I really don't think that you were going to blow my spot up. Like, I just, I don't see it. Which, I don't, I'm not mad at. Can I tell you how much I love watching Keith play, uh, what, what is it? Is he playing blackjack? Like, guys, he plays exactly the way that I would play. This guy is like, it's two bucks, buddy. And I would just be, mm, I couldn't do it. I would be a wreck. Gambling is not for me. Meanwhile, Veronica is setting up this dude so that she can figure out who the mugger is. And she's working with the first victim that we see on camera that's like getting, um, that had gotten mugged. And he is the best his name is corny billy black in twilight thank you anius i was like i know i've seen him in one other role and i think that actor is hot so i'm here for him every time he shows up but i was like yeah i've seen him in three things total and he's been a casino owner in two of them um yeah corny is the best this actor is corny like he i don't think he's playing a role i think he's straight up this person and they were just like yeah, no, he's this guy. We're just putting him in. Like, he can just be himself on the camera, and that's fine. He is so legit about every every line. There is, like, dripping with sincerity. He's so... It does not feel like he's playing a role. He is such a fucking goof. She asks if he's ready to be the bait, and he says, you could call me the master bait, and then clicks his fingers, like... What are you even doing? And the look she gets on his face after he does that is just, it is all of us. I love it so much. Um, But yeah, he's wonderful. I love, I want him in every episode, to be honest, at this point. Like, he's just a priceless little cinnamon roll and he really should get his own spinoff show. Um, But yeah, so they wind up setting up this kid that it turns out... uh, is totally unrelated to the blackmailer. Like he has no idea what Veronica is even talking about. He has just been setting people up so that he can mug them. And she and Corny tape him to a stop sign and then call the cops. And he is left there after she uses backup to intimidate him, by the way, which I fucking am here for backup. I I think I've said before that we haven't gotten enough of him and I was really sad about it. And I'm really happy that now backup gets another like moment in the sun. Um, so Veronica is like tracking down the blackmailer. I love that when they go to the pirate ship website, the picture of the pirate is, uh, has like all of the different gender symbols on its hat and is wearing makeup and everything. It's pretty great. And she's got a couple different people that she has her eye on, but one of them, it turns out is the dude who died in the bus crash because she's like, Oh, he shows up and then disappears. Don't you think that's suspicious? Which no. And finally she starts to figure out that it's actually Kylie. And I kind of, I kind of hated this. I'm not even gonna lie to you guys. Like, this reveal, it just felt so lazy in a way. Like, basically, it comes down to that Kylie is, like, really just wants her girlfriend to come out of the closet so bad that she kind of forces her into it, which I don't really, like, enjoy that whole... I don't know. Um, I'm trying to find the exact moment where she talks about it with her so that I can. Oh, yeah. I know who lives there. Um, hey, blackmailer. And Kylie says, I figured I'd be seeing you sometime today. Um, oh, that's right. Because they dropped off the money and she leaves like a tracker in it. Um, 
I thought I was being so clever with the whole dead le- dead letter. What is it? I'm trying to read her exact dialogue here so that I don't like. Um, I thought I was being so clever with the whole dead letter office thing. That's what it is. You knew the money would make its way to the post office. How'd you ever get in to retrieve the package? My mom works there. Oh, nice. Um, So I'm assuming Kelly wants his money back. And Veronica's like, yeah, I would think so. And asks, why'd you do it? I wanted to get out of Neptune after graduation. There goes that plan. Community college. Here I come. Which, okay. And then, besides, I didn't care much about self-hating kissing cousin. I would have slept just fine knowing that Kelly Cusio was driving around rimless. Um, why'd you out Marlena? Cause I'm a horrible, crazy bitch. You want to know what's worse? I told her the blackmailer was bluffing. I told her not to pay. Um, I wanted to be out, but I wanted Marlena out with me. I wanted to be able to walk down the halls with her like a real couple. So she fake blackmailed her own girlfriend in order to force her to come out and told her not to pay so that she would have an excuse as the blackmailer to out her. Like, that's really despicable, honestly, guys. Like, seriously, I really hope that Marlena dumps her because that's just so unforgivable to me to do that to somebody that you're in like just I really really hate the fact that Kylie just gets to tell Veronica all of this and then walk away and be like I'd like to tell her myself if that's okay why does she get any say in how any of this goes down like just because she's also gay she gets like a pass on how she has treated everybody else She's like, I I don't care for self-hating kissing cousin. He's rightfully worried about his safety, dude. Like, that's not your call. Just because you don't, just because he's contributing to homophobia at your school. It sucks. It's shitty. It's selfish. Sure. But like, dude, seriously, what are you doing? You can tell him that you know and that you're going to like, you know, that that there could be consequences for this without just like fucking his life up. I don't know. I just, I did not care for this. The the whole thing of it was like, Oh, and I wanted money for college. Like whatever. I'm not, I just don't have any sympathy for tormenting people like this about something that is not their, their fault. This is like not something that they're doing wrong. This is just who they are. I just, ugh, I hated that. Um, But anyway, so they are like Veronica and Jackie, when they go to this hangar, there's also like a whole fucking helicopter here. Um, And she's Jackie's asking her which of the cars she wants, yada, yada, yada. And they go to the game. They're talking about how amazing Wallace was and agreeing that they are not going to, uh, they're not going to tell him how great he was because they feel like he's going to be impossible to live with if his ego gets any bigger. And Veronica is saying, all right, well, like we have this deal. Maybe we can get along after all. They park the top on the convertible won't go up. Veronica says that she thinks that she can fix it. And she's looking around for some kind of tool. And when she opens the uh, tool box off to the side, there are all kinds of incendiary devices and detonators. And we don't see her, like we don't see Jackie's reaction. We just see Veronica's face when she sees all this stuff. And then she goes straight to her dad. I really want to know what the fuck Jackie said. Does Jackie know what these things are from looking at them the way that Veronica seems to? Does Veronica tell her I have to tell my dad the truth about this? What in the fuck is like and 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 the guy who worked on his cars isn't the suspect? It's him? I don't get the feeling that this is a hands-on kind of guy that's out here being a mechanic with these sports cars. He said that he hired a dude. 
So why couldn't it be that guy? They just assume that it's Terrence. Like, there's just a lot of leaps here and a lot of, like, disconnect from when she finds them to when she goes and tells her father that I don't understand. And her father immediately being like, um, oh, I guess my gut feeling was wrong. And I'm like, there's no reason to think that yet, dude. Why are you just assuming that? But I guess we'll see what happens. I just don't really think that there's a... I don't think that there's enough yet for them to be leaping to the conclusions that they are. Um, maybe she hid it from Jackie so she can investigate quietly. I mean, she might have, but that moment she opens it. Jackie's like, are you okay? And gets out of the car and we see her walking towards Veronica and then it cuts to her telling her dad. So if she did cover it up, I can't imagine that that went very well or that Jackie didn't sense something was wrong or who knows what. I just feel like none of the options that she has available to her are good or going to work out well. Um, so yeah, I'm way over time, so I really have to end this, but thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out with me. Thank you, Rachel, again for the commission. I'm looking forward to doing the next one. I'm really curious what the fuck is going to happen. Um, and yeah, I just also like what Logan, what are you doing, buddy? What's going on? Um, so yeah, thank you all again. I had a lot of fun and I'll see you soon with a new episode. Toodaloo motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.